program running on some uh, processor and the program, all of the memory of that program is stored externally in some untrusted place. Could be internally in an untrusted place, but we're not trusting the memory. And uh, we want to protect this memory. We want to make sure that even though the, the adversary has access to this memory and access to the data pattern, doesn't learn anything. And ORAM is a way to do that. It's a compiler that takes the program and sort of modifies it a little bit. It's going to actually run the original program. Whenever the program wants to read some location I in memory, this compiler will actually translate it into a bunch of uh, other read and write instructions that's going to actually execute. Uh, and it's going to do it in such a way that even if you see the access pattern, you see these instructions, you're not really learning anything about these instructions. You're hiding the access pattern here, the actual physical access pattern. Okay, so that, that's the basic ORAM setting. Of course, you can also do write, and you're just going to execute the program with this ORAM compiler that's going to provide security. Uh, but often the way we think about, um, about this type of model is that, um, is, is that this memory is actually stored on some sort of a cloud server, some sort of an external, you know, you're storing it in the cloud. And the cloud server is not just memory, it has more, it can do computation. Maybe you can leverage that. So um, let me just, uh, before I go there, tell you a little bit about what we know in this model. So this is just summarizing what Elaine told you. So usually the way we me measure efficiency in this model is just uh, we want to say for each one of these operations, the logical operation the program is doing, how many actual uh, logical or physical operations uh, does it get translated into. I'll call that the D, that's the overhead. And we can get uh, log n overhead with sufficiently large block size that's using the pathogram scheme that Elaine told you about. And in fact, we even have a lower bond the, uh, by Goldrack and Ostrowski that tells you that in some sense is the best you can hope for. And by the way, this lower bound has, there's a bunch of caveats in that lower bound, so you should take it with a little bit of grain of salt, but at the very least, we don't know how to do better in this model. Okay, so at least that. So uh, I wanna move into a slightly different model where, uh, again, motivated by the fact that we're really thinking of this memory as being on some sort of a cloud server, remote cloud server, and here the server can perform useful computations. So that's the difference. We replaced uh, the memory before with, with the server now. And probably the memory would be inside the server, but I'm just going to, inside the box, but I'm just going to show it outside on the picture. Okay, so what can we do here? Uh, so the first thing we can do is that now instead of uh, the ORAM just being a sequence, translating a read instruction to a sequence of read and write instructions to this external memory, it can do a more complicated protocol and have the server do some of that computation. That's the main idea. And of course the server is going to read and write to memory, but we don't have to like send each one of these instructions directly to the server. We don't have to send it uh, explicitly. Okay, so uh, the talk is roughly in three parts. So in the first part, I'm gonna show you how to leverage this model to do an ORAM where the communication overhead, so that's actually the communication of this link per operation is constant, not logarithmic. So we're shaving the log factor. Okay, previously to sort of do log, logarithmic uh, communication or logarithmic multiple times the communication you would have for each operation, we're gonna shave that off in this model. In the second part, I'm going to actually talk about interaction. I wanna reduce the amount, yeah. What is the constant that is hiding in this particular uh, Actually, I think it'd be as low as two. Uh, that's actually not, if you make the block size big enough, so that, that's, the, that's, the, you know, that's where you have some flexibility. But it can, that can be small. There's no security parameter. There's no, 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 no secure parameter, like two. <laughs> yeah. The block size is the entire memory, then the cost is one. Exactly. So, so the block size will be polylogarithmic. It's not going to be that huge. Uh, it's not going to be the entire memory. Yeah, we're not going to cheat that much. We'll cheat a little bit. Um, good point. Okay. Uh, so this is about the communication complexity. In the next time, next uh, part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about the um, the round complexity. I want to make this actual whole process interact non-interactive. So if you look at it, there's sort of two sources of interaction here. So first of all, this protocol could be interactive. Like there's interaction going on here each time the program wants to read a location. That's one source of interaction, so you could ask to remove that. But we're going to be more ambitious. There's another source of interaction here that's maybe even worse, which is each time the program reads a location, you have to do some interaction with the server, right? 
And so we're going to get rid of all of that and just have complete non-interactive solutions. So you take the whole program, somehow send it over to the server in some hidden way, garbled way, um, and the server will be able to run it. So there's completely non-interactive. You just send the program, the whole program, to the server. The server doesn't learn anything. Okay. So we'll completely remove interaction. This is called garbled RAM. So uh, why is the server will not know the output? So in this case, actually, uh, I'm going to change the problem a little bit and let the server actually compute the output himself. If you want to hide it, you can always encrypt. So that, th this is strict, strict, strictly better. If you can do this, you can also hide the output. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. So, that. so I am changing it a little bit. Good point. Uh, so these are a little bit incomparable. In the first part, uh, I'm going to get rid of uh, communication complexity to reduce that. In the second part, actually, the communication complexity will be maybe worse than the first part, or still polylogarithmic. There will be overhead, but we're getting rid of round complexity. And the third part, uh, I'm going to talk about succinct garbled RAM. I'll just mention it a little bit. And it's going to be pretty much the same model as the second part, but everything will be incredibly succinct. So this uh, value here that the client is sending to the server just depends on the code of the program. It doesn't depend on the running time or anything like that. So you're drastically removing the communication. You're not even doing you know, one operation per read access or anything like that. So I'm going to call that that's the same model, but a lazy client, he doesn't execute it. She doesn't execute the program herself. OK. So let me start with the first part, low communication ORAM. So I'm going to describe a scheme to you called onion ORAM. Uh, this joint work with Chris Fletcher, Ling Ren, Srini Devadas, Martin Van Dyke, and Elaine Chi. And the idea is we're going to have an ORAM where the communication overhead per data access is just order one. So we're shaving the log n factor. But uh, as Rafi mentioned, we're, we will need a sufficiently large block size. There will be some polylog n, but uh, I think something, I, I don't actually know the exact polylog, maybe log cubed or something like that. Uh, but uh, we are, it does need to be big enough. And this client, and we also don't want the server to just you know, have to do the whole computation or something like that, have to read the entire memory. So the server computation and the client computation is still polylog in. Okay, so the main thing we're improving though is the communication. And uh, we'll show how to get security even against a fully malicious server, so active attacks will be interesting too. And the whole thing will rely on additively homomorphic encryption for uh, various reasons, specifically the Domgard Euro crypto system, or you can use somewhat homomorphic encryption. But we don't need very heavy, like fully homomorphic encryption tools. Okay, so let's start with some initial ideas. What's the main idea of how to do this? What, what, what's the adversarial model? What is the server trying to do? It's the same as ORAM. So the server is trying to learn something about the access pattern. So actually, the, the, the property we'll want is that the server doesn't learn anything. You can simulate the view of the server. Um, server gets zero information here. What are the instructions for this? Read and write. Well, what, what, you said that server is doing computation. Right. What, what computation? Is that? Well, so let, let me go back, actually, to this picture. So. Uh, the server seeing is interacting in this protocol. The client's goal is to do read and write instructions, to like read the ith bit or write the ith block bit to memory. So the client's goal is the regular ORAM setting, but instead of directly translating it to a bunch of reads and writes on the server, we're going to translate it to some protocol. And the security is the same, though, as, as in ORAM. Server shouldn't learn anything. Yeah. It's, it's server-rated ORAM, right? Yeah. yeah, so I call it ORAM with server computation, server-rated ORAM. There's, yeah, many names for it. And I do want to say it's been considered. People have considered this before in several works, using the server to leverage something. How many rounds do you have constant rounds? Well, I guess. Uh, const, uh, constant, yeah, I think constant, actually. Constant so number of rounds. Overall, you would need, like, log q bits or whatever. There's polylog bits and constant rounds. Right. So you want to get polylog, and you will get so yeah, you want to get a block of size b bits, which, which is polylog, and you'll, your communication will be 2b, auto b. With constant rounds. Okay. With constant rounds, yeah. <coughs> um, OK. So let's do an initial idea. And one idea is, why don't we just use, so forget about ORAM altogether, use private information retrieval, or FHE. So here, um, the client would just send um, an encryption of the, of the bit that he wants to read or the location on the memory that she wants to read and we'll just run peer and get that back to the client. 
So the bad news about that solution is that here the server's work is as big as the entire data, order of n, where n is the data size. So that's bad. We still want the server's work to be polylogarithmic. We don't want to go uh, to this setting. And also, even if you actually want to do this, you have to think about it a little bit. You do need a peer where you have, or, or an FHE, which has constant overhead. So when you want to download, when you're doing a peer and the block size is B, your response is just order of B bits. And some, some peers have that, but it's not trivial. It's not a generic property of peers. So you, you would need something special here. But from FHE, you can always get it back. No, not directly, not generically. Actually, you, if you think about FHE, each bit is encrypted separately. So for each bit, you have at least security parameter overhead no, no. on the response, on the response, on the, on the computed value. You can get, so that, and that's what I care about. Yeah, so it's not generic. I don't know how to do this generically from FHE. Just a comment, so this marrying of uh, 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 ORAM and peer also plays a role if you consider peer writing. Well, for peer That's writing, right. you can actually do even information series in peer writing by cooking some ORAM inside the peer writing and, and, and <coughs> something related. Right, good. So, uh, so here, I mean, I guess if you're allowing the server to do auto of N work, you could actually do writing with FHE as well. But the main thing is we want to somehow get rid of this sort of end work. And like Rafi said, the solution will be to somehow marry ORAM and peer. Uh, so we're going to do FHE, or not necessarily fully homomorphic encryption, but some homomorphic encryption over ORAM. I want to say there, there are previous works that have thought about this. I'm probably not including all the citations. Um, but the idea is instead of having the client manually move data around on the server, the client is going to instruct the server on how to move the data around under fully homomorphic encryption. I'm going to tell you exactly what I mean by that. But that's a high level idea. So if you remember, this is the picture of the tree or RAM, or the path or RAM, either one. Uh, so I'm drawing the tree the other way. So if you were tilting your head before, now you have to untilt. Uh, now you can untilt. Um, and um, so the main invariant here is that we have some data blocks residing in a tree. Each block is mapped to a particular leaf. And each block must be on a path uh, from the root to that leaf. Okay, so um, uh, that's the that's the main that's the data structure that's stored on the server, and it'll be useful for us to actually separate that into two components. Think of this data structure as consisting of data, which is the actual block values. So these are sort of large block values that are in these in these buckets that are residing in the tree, and also um, all right some metadata. Which, uh, which is small, and the metadata would be the block address, like the address of the block that's in this position, what leaf it is assigned to, and things along those lines. OK, great, thanks. Uh, and also the position map. So the whole position map, we can think of that as metadata. It doesn't depend on the block size, for example. OK, so how does this trio RAM work? Well, I want to think of it as separating it into two types of operations. So there's the operations on the metadata, which are things like using the uh, position map to find which, which uh, leaf a block is assigned to, uh, or things like reading all of these addresses of the blocks on a path so you know exactly which blocks are there. Okay, so those are the types of things you're going to do on the metadata, just read all of it. And on the data, intuitively, what you want to do is somehow move it around in an oblivious way. Okay, so you might want to either obliviously read a particular block, like I want to read this block but I don't want to reveal which block on the path I'm reading. Or I want to actually move blocks like down the tree without revealing where I'm moving them. Okay, so that I'm moving around obliviously. And the way we did it before, or the way the tree ORAM or path ORAM or any of these schemes do it, is just by downloading the whole path and moving them around manually. Okay, and that's what we want to get rid of. <laughs> so first of all, the metadata we're going to just be able to read it and write to it manually. We're just going to do the same thing we did before, just read all the metadata all the time. And the nice thing is because the metadata is small, this is independent of the block size. So yeah, it's polylog and uh, communication to do that. But if I make the block size big enough, this is order of the block size. So this is much less than the size of one block. And by the way, I should just mention, making the block relatively big makes sense in, in a lot of practical situations. Like if you have a file system, the files are reasonably big. So you want to download file, you want to download a, a large block. Having a large block is not a big deal. Okay. 
So uh, the metadata, I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm just going to read all of it. Once I read the metadata, I know exactly where I want to move data around, and I know which data. So during a read, for example, I know exactly which data block I actually want to read. I want this one, right? I already know the address there. I know that's the one I care about. And so to do the operation on the data, I'm just going to use it with, I'm just going to do it with homomorphic operations. So previously I would just read all of it, that would be B log and work, where B is the block size. Now with something like FHE, or we'll see we don't actually need FHE, but um, with some homomorphic computation, this will be just on the order of the block size. So log n previously was because it was a pest. <laughs> exactly, I had to, like, to read this block, I needed to hide which one I'm reading, I needed to read the whole path. Well, yeah. Number of trees. So the number of trees, remember the other trees are storing addresses. So the whole recursion, the whole that all of that is independent of the block size. I, I, I'm thinking of that as metadata. All the other trees are metadata. Only the top tree is data. Okay. So with FHG, this can be just on the order of the block size. But do we really need FHG? So the hope will be to get rid of it. So let's see, what do we need to do? We need to do some sort of a homomorphic select. We have these k blocks. Think of these as the values on a path in the tree. So k is something logarithmic in n, polylogarithmic in n. And we want to select one of them, like the ith one. Okay, either we want to select it because we're reading it or we want to select it because we want to move it to some other location. So how would you do it? How would you implement this operation? So option one is with fully homomorphic encryption, I can just encrypt the index i to the server and the server can do this computation that computes the encryption of the block i. Is it different than generic peer? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, with peer you can do this. Okay, so with peer, I'll tell you in a second. But yeah, so with homomorphic, with FHE or peer, you could, you could do this. And you will get encryption of block i. One, uh, so one difference with peer is that the number of blocks is actually not that big. It's still logarithmic, okay? I'm just trying to shave that factor. So one other thing you could do, this is a little different, but here we're gonna do, we're gonna use homomorphic encryption that supports just one multiplication, okay? So what can you do? That's a concrete peer, right? I mean. That's a concrete, uh, yeah, it's a concrete peer. The main difference, okay, maybe I'll tell you now, the main difference is I also need to compute again on the peer output, so I do, so we'll see, that's the difference. That, that's really why peer is not good enough. But, uh, so this is a concrete, you can think of it as a concrete peer, I can just encrypt bits for each location. <coughs> These are sort of much smaller ciphertext than the whole block. So I have K ciphertext, but I'm thinking of this whole K ciphertext as being much smaller than one of these. So I can communicate that, that's not, that's not a lot of communication. I can give these to the server and then the server can just multiply this, uh, you know, can multiply these values and sum them up and get the encryption of block i. So this just requires a uh, homomorphic encryption with one multiplication and many additions. Okay, one multiplication many additions is still, multiplications are hard, let's get rid of multiplications altogether. So you can do that. We can do it with no multiplications, the same thing. The only difference is that now I want to think of this value as not an actual encryption, even though it is an encryption. I want to think of it as a plain text value that I'm multiplying into this ciphertext. So it's sort of a scalar multiplication rather than a ciphertext multiplication. And I can do that. The only difference is that at the end, I get an encryption of an encryption of block of i, because I'm treating this in internal encryption as just data, right, as a plain text value. And so that's why this scheme is called onion ORAM. We're sort of going to be increasing the levers of, or onion layers of encryption under which the block will be encrypted. This is a regular peer. Uh, this is a regular. Uh, you're retrieving uh, an encrypted uh, value. Exactly. So that's what Benny said. So the only thing is. Uh, it could even be the second E could be a different E. It could be a different E. So this is a regular peer. The only thing is we're need, we'll need to perform these homomorphic operations iteratively. So when I move a data block, when I do this select, I'm going to say, okay, take whatever output you get and put it in this bucket. Later on, I'm going to have to move it again. Each time I move it, I'm going to have to do this operation. So I'm going to have to take the outputs of this operation and, and again perform the same operation on them. I'm going to perform this select iteratively, not just once. That's the main difference with peer. Okay, and you can do that just the sort of layers. As you do it, the layers of encryption will grow. The number of layers will grow. So the question is, how many times do you, ha do you, can, do you have to do it? So uh, let's go back and see how many times are we moving things around. Well. 
previously when we are doing evictions, and this is true for either PathORAM or TreeORAM, it doesn't really matter, you were always evicting blocks from sort of higher up to lower down. Okay, you were moving blocks from high up in the tree to lower down in the tree. So that's fine, that sort of seems like the layers of encryption are just increasing at each layer of the tree because you're always moving things from here to here, you're just adding another layer. But the problem is you also had to evict, sometimes the block stayed in the bucket it was in. You were moving the blocks around, and sometimes you couldn't move it anywhere, it had to stay there. Whenever that happened, you would increase the layer of encryption without moving the block lower down. And there was no bound on the number of layers you could eventually incur. This could happen many, many times. And that way you would get a lot of layers. You would eventually, the, just this encrypted block would get too large. It wouldn't be constant overhead. So the main thing here is to have a new eviction strategy, which is sort of a variant of the previous ones, but it guarantees some sort of steady progress. The data blocks cannot stay in the same place during evictions. They always move down. Whenever you touch a block, it moves somewhere. It moves down the tree. And this ensures that we can bound the number of layers of encryption that you get on each block by login or order of login. So, okay? Yeah. So why not just after you touch every node login times, download it, re-encrypt, steep all the layers, encrypt as one layer, put it back, and asymptotically, it's not going to make any difference because you do it every, say, login times. Uh, we are going to do that, essentially, but uh, you're not touching just one block at a time. To get rid of the problem of, of this um, nested encryption, you can just say, okay, when it grows too big, the nesting just strip all the layers in one shot. And you have to be a little careful because you don't want to leak to the server with which block has... Um... No, in the, fixed, in the fixed time, right? Every login steps, I strip all the layers. But actually, so in each operation you're adding login layers to many blocks, right? Because you're moving many blocks down. So it's not clear how many you'd have to download. Because you can download only one each time. You don't have enough bandwidth to download more than one. But you're adding layers to multiple blocks. Are you saying every login times I access the same paths? But the, the paths will overlap. So, so it, it's hard. It's not well defined. What does it mean? So also, Rafi, the thing is that every, uh, every operation I'm touching at least log and I'm adding a layer to log and blocks. But every operation I can strip all the layer from only one block. So you, that's not, do you see the problem? I'm adding, I'm adding a an, an layer to many blocks, every, every one I touch on the path. But I'm, I can only strip off one from one block. Let's say there is some node which has between you know, 10 log n and 20 log n layers already. Then this uh, f false elements in that node. Then it's, you know, whenever you reach this condition, go and... Uh, but how do you know there's only one? Maybe during an operation you suddenly have log n nodes of this type, right? Whenever any node reaches this condition, it's a sick patient, go and... Uh... Good, but you might have to cure too many sick patients, right? So the communication will get... The, the point is that I, I want to have, make sure I'm only curing one... I can only do this on one patient in each read, otherwise I'm downloading too much. Maybe let's, uh, let's continue offline. Because in this game, you only upload these homomorphic select access no, but, 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 the, but the server sees how much it grows, right? It sees how yes, much yes, that, that's not hidden information. No, but most, the, most of the growth is by the server, right? right? So, okay, let's take it off. Let's, let, yeah, let's, let's take it offline. So, but you're right, we're actually going to do something like that only on the, on the bucket layer, on, on the leaf layer. So in the leaf layer, you know, there's nowhere these blocks can go, so they do have to stay there. They will incur additional layers, and we will actually download manually and strip off these layers, exactly what Rafi said, on the leaf layer. But we're bounding the, the number of values for which we have to do that just to the ones at the leaf layer. Yeah? Uh, doesn't the circuit ORAM that Elaine described before have this property? Uh, so Elaine, can you, maybe Elaine can answer that. Um, I have to think about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. So, so the variant is not a huge variant. So, so let me just say it's not a huge variant from prior schemes. It's an eviction strategy along the lines of what was done before. But there's subtle changes that need to be made. and also in the analysis. But you also need to make sure that when you add layers, each layer adds additive overhead, not multiplicative, right? Perfect. So I think so, so two, two, two bullet points, uh, and I'll say it. So, uh, so this ensures that we have log n onion layers 
uh, on, on each ciphertext or at most log and uh, onion layers on each ciphertext. We want to make sure that log and onion layers only increase the ciphertext size by a factor of some constant, like let's say at most two. So we need to be very careful, as Evgeny said, so this is great, it's a great interactive talk. Uh, we need to be very careful with ciphertext expansion. So we need to make sure that if you add log and onion layers of encryption, you only increase in order one expansion. So this means that each layer can add very little, like an additive amount. It can't, so for example, just even double the size of the ciphertext. That would be too much because two, two, time, you know, two to the log n is n, right? So, um, and this is achieved by the Domgard Uri crypto system. Could you replace layers with just the degree that it supports? Exactly. Yes. So this would so also this strategy is useful if you have somewhat homomorphic encryption where the somewhat isn't that big. Okay. So I want to say a little bit about uh, active security as well. Please, yeah. So how did you get the encryption of the selection bit? The the client sends that to the server. So let me. That will be like for each uh, each recursion step, no? So the client will send this vector of encryptions. How many are there? Just the number of blocks in the path that I'm reading. So there'll be logarithmically many of them, but these are small. These are just bits, okay? So they're much smaller than the block size. So this log n encryptions are just, don't add too much overhead. Each recursion layer, the client computes this. Uh, no, no, not that, it doesn't matter what the recursion layers here. I'm treating these blocks as plain text, so I, I don't care how many layers are on them. I'm just gonna add one more layer when I do this. So like for eviction, I mean, you have to figure out all kind of things. <clears throat> How do you just get away with just figuring out one block to work on? Oh, oh good. Yeah, I, I am going to need to do this for each block I'm moving. So I'm going to do this log n time. I'm going to send log n vectors like that, not just one. That's a good point for each, each block in the path I'm moving. But that's still, again, these vectors are small, so if the block size is big enough polylogarithmic, then all of this is nothing compared to, the, to just reading one block. How does the client know where to put the one? Like usually you don't know where the block is until you go look. So the client reads the metadata, so he knows where every block is. And that's essentially free. That's essentially free because every, the block size is big enough that all of this little stuff is irrelevant. Yeah. Okay, so let me say a little about active security. So um, in the case of ORAM without server computation, active security is never a big deal. I mean, most papers don't talk about it or, uh, because there's a generic way you can add it. You can generically protect against active attacks by using Merkle trees or memory checking to authenticate each position. As you're reading, you just ve so the client would keep the hash of the Merkle tree just of all the data that's stored in the server, and every time he reads a location from the server, just checks that he's getting the right value, and every time he writes, he would update the, the Merkle tree accordingly. So there's a generic way of protecting against active attacks in the, in the setting without server computation. But what about onion ORAM with server computation? You can't do that because now you're instructing the server to do complicated operations, not just write and read values on, the, on, on his storage. So one answer is you can solve this using SNARKs, uh, succinct non-interactive arguments of knowledge. You can sort of solve everything with them. They're a very powerful tool. Uh, unfortunately, they're, um, they're based on strong non-falsifiable assumptions, and they're not very efficient in practice, uh, at least not yet. So uh, we have another answer, a very simple way to do this, no new assumptions and realistically efficient um, for this particular scheme. The idea consists of really two components. So one is um, we we're going to protect the metadata with the Merkle tree. So we're going to use that solution on the metadata, which you do actually read and write to one bit at a time. You're not doing any complicated operations on that. But the actual data, which you're not just reading and writing directly, you're sort of instructing the server to do stuff on it, we're going to have a different solution that are uh, called verification chunks. So let me tell you what that is. So I want to think of each encrypted block as consisting of, of a bunch of chunks, Q chunks. Chunks are relatively small, Q is relatively big. Okay. And uh, a homomorphic select operation just prefer, pre, uh, operates independently on each chunk position. So whenever you do this like homomorphic operation to, to, uh, to select one of these blocks, you're just going to independently select one of the chunks in this column, the chunk in this column. Uh, you know, you're going to select the same row in every column. So you're going to take one operation and perform it in every column independently. 
And so here's the idea. The idea will be that the client will just take a random subset of these chunks and store them in the metadata. Okay, small, small subset, so constant size or security parameter size, not enough to make a difference, much smaller than the whole block. And each time the client performs one of the homomorphic select operations to move data around, he can actually download these chunks, these I'll call them verification chunks that he's storing in the metadata, and do that operation manually himself on these chunks. So he's doing the same thing the server's doing, but not on the whole block, just on some small subset of these chunks. Like cut and choose, you know? It's very much like cut and choose, right? And so every and then whenever the client actually reads a block from the server, he can check that the chunks in those positions are correct because he has those in the metadata. He's done everything on them manually himself. Okay, so uh, this pretty much works. Um, of course, here if the server cheats on a random position, you're not that likely to catch him. You have some small chance of catching him, but not that high. But we can amplify this by using error correcting codes. Okay, so this solution with error correcting codes gets you to get active uh, malicious security with verification queries. Uh, so um, no, uh, but we don't. That I, so in some sense, it's not as much of a problem here because anyway, this is uh, the sort of one server, and if he cheats you, you know, you you stop. You have to stop. Is this so what kind of security do you get? Like you, you don't get normality or something like this, right? I mean, you do. Uh, you, you you make sure that uh, every time you you perform a read, you get the right value out, the one that should be written there. And even if the server is active, he can't break your privacy. <coughs> so, an act you get both the active active privacy and correctness. Is this a generic memory checking, uh, or, or are you it, how, how is it combined or specific to? No, it's actually pretty specific. I mean, I'm using the fact that there's a big block, and you're doing sort of operating on the doing the same operation on every chunk of that block independently. So it's, it's not a very generic solution, <laughs> but it is related to some concepts, some of these solutions from verifiable computation, uh, some of these cut and choose techniques, like Evgeny said. Okay. So uh, the punchline here is that we get active security essentially for free, just with this solution. You don't need any new assumptions or any, any really new tricks. You know, I guess uh, how many chunks will the build for a log? A log? Uh, security parameter, yeah. So the server does security parameter, <coughs> passive security, right? The client, you mean, because he has to read these chunks. Right, no, but the server also previously there was only one. No, log. but it's not a multiplicative, right? It's an additive polylog. So it, it doesn't actually change the asymptotics. You don't have several ciphertexts you're saying is, is just... Uh, so the encryption is, so this blocks. So think of the blocks as pretty big, and you're storing like very few bits or small chunks of these blocks uh, in the metadata. So this doesn't really asymptotically have much of an impact. Just a, just a comment. So in, in, in my original ORAM, because I knew exactly when I'm writing any memory location, you can just timestamp and sign everything so you don't right. even need Merkle trees. Good point, you yeah. Malicious security without even Merkle Yes, tree. yes. So because and, and in tree ORAM as well, because things are already stored in a tree, Merkle tree is essentially for free because it's already in a tree structure. But but I yeah, I'm ignoring these uh, yeah. So, so polylog so you factors. Can achieve a similar effect by just changing the program, like doing the previous thing on a modified program. What, what previous thing? The, your original thing without the verification. Just, just the Merkle tree. No no no. The, the, your, your, with no uh, Merkle tree, nothing. Okay. But, uh, uh, or maybe only on the uh, metadata, but, but uh, modifying the, the program in a way that essentially uh, uh, emulate these chunks, this, this verification? I'm not sure. I, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I, at least I don't see it. Okay. So, um, so that, 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 that's all I want to say about, uh, about onion ORM. The punchline is you can get very small bandwidth, okay? Small communication overhead if the block size are big enough. Let me now move on to the next part, garbled garbogram. Okay, how much time do I have? Uh, um, let's say um, 25 more minutes. Okay, great. So uh, garbled RAM is an analog of garbled circuits that work in the RAM setting. It was an idea that was in, uh, introduced by uh, Lou and Ostrovsky, both here. Uh, and the idea is that now the client will take the entire program that he wants to execute on this remotely stored data, in some sense garble it, Okay, do something to it, and produce this, uh, I'm going to use tildes to denote garbled stuff, so produce this garbled program, p tilde, 
he'll send that to the server and the server can execute it on the on this on the memory on the outsourced memory and give and create and get the output back that it can send back to the client okay um, the cost of garbling here and the size of this garbled program in this solution is as big as the running time, the RAM runtime of the original program. So the client isn't saving any work. He's running the program himself, but he doesn't have the data. He's sort of doing the work of running the program himself without knowing the data, creates this garbled program, and then sends it to the server. The server knows the data and can actually execute it. So this, there's no saving of work. The client's doing all the work of running the program. We're saving on rounds instead of like uh, running the program by doing each read independently by executing some protocol with the server, we're doing it all in one go, one shot. Okay, so uh, I'll let me give you a slightly better definition with a slightly different picture of a client. So here uh, we have two algorithms. Uh, there's an algorithm that garbles data, so it takes some data and a key and creates the garbled data. That's what you outsource to the server. That's sort of the pre-processing of the data. That's what you store on the server. And then you can garble various programs P. I'm thinking of all the inputs to the program as being hard-coded in the program itself. So you're going to somehow garble a program that you want to run with the, whatever inputs you want to run it at. Uh, send it to the server, and um, the server will be able to evaluate this garbled program by using memory access to garble data. I want to mention these programs. You can do this many times. You can garble many, many programs on the same data. Okay. So think of it as many different database queries. Um, these programs can actually write to the data. They can both read and write. Okay, these are read-write programs. And so the order in which they're executed matters, right? It's not the same as executing one first and second one second versus flipping it because these are writing to the data. So here when the client garbles these programs, he also has the index i, the order in which they're garbled, and the server can only execute them in that order. Okay, so the security property is that the server will only learn the outputs of these programs, the Y1, Y2, Y3, the outputs, and nothing else. And these are the outputs if you ran the program in the correct order, the programs in the correct order. So, Mr. Chair, so when we know was talking about like garbled circuits, I mean, it doesn't matter, Ramos uh, circuits, so he was addressing a related but strictly weaker programs that you would just first garble a circuit and then quickly can do garbling of each input. So it's exactly the same you store data and program. Except yeah, so, so, so far mm, this looks like garbled circuit. The main difference is going to be the efficiency considerations, which I'm going to tell you in a second. So first of all, let me, let me tell you about the efficiency, and then maybe if, if things aren't clear, you'll ask again. So uh, garbling the data should take just time proportion to the size of the data. And this O tilde is hiding lock factors and also security parameter factors, so I'm going to ignore those. And uh, garbling the program should take time proportional to the RAM runtime of the program, as well as evaluating the program should take time proportional to the RAM runtime of the program. So for example, this program could be a binary search query. And then garbling it would be pretty efficient, as would executing it. Okay, just time proportional to binary search, even though this data is huge. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. I mean, I understand that here you concentrate on RAM, so I'm just uh, kind of curious. So if it was garbled circuit for a second, the main thing is that you can do <coughs> and the previous thing couldn't do writes. So you're like swapping no. the program and data, right? So previously you right. have a circuit and there were like multiple inputs that you can, but so, the efficiency was much faster than the inputs. <coughs> Right, the input is just proportional to so the... So previously, let me just say, previously I could have done this where this was proportional to the circuit size of the program execution there than the RAM runtime. So if it was a database query, like a SQL query, it would be proportional to the whole database, not the binary search, right? Not log. That's the difference. The difference is the efficiency. You could have done this reusable stuff as well. That's not the thing. That this like running many programs. Okay. Good. So is the security and is this that clear, the security goal here? Okay. Uh, so uh, we can relax security a little bit. It'll be useful to actually look at a weaker security where we're going to say it's okay if this, uh, if this garbled program actually reveals or if we reveal even the contents of the data. We're not going to try to hide the contents of the data. And even we're not going to try to hide the data access pattern. But that's the only thing you learn. You don't learn anything else about the program other than its data access pattern and the data that it's accessing. OK, so that sounds like a lot weaker. Here I'm revealing the locations of the memory that are accessed in each step. I'm revealing the values that are read and written to memory in each step. It sounds like a lot weaker. But the great news is that's good enough. If you can do this, you can get the full thing. How? 
just compile the program with oblivious RAM. Take whatever program you would have executed it, compile it with oblivious RAM, so now run the program that would use oblivious RAM to read the data. So even if you see the data access pattern of the compiled program, you don't learn anything about the, what the original program was doing. Okay, so this is a generic solution, so it's good enough to focus on this weak security. What is hidden? The program. Just the program. Yeah, whatever inputs it has, whatever secret keys it has, all that's hidden. You just learn the data that it's reading and writing and the access pattern. Okay, so we can focus on this weak security notion. And so let me give you an overview of the garbled RAM construction of Lou and Ostrowski. So it's really a beautiful scheme. Um, and for now, I want to focus, make my life even easier, I just want to focus on read-only computations. So assume the program just reads, never writes to the database, to the data, okay? Read-only. So before I tell you how to do this, how to garble this program, let's look at sort of RAM program execution without garbling, without security, okay? So this is uh, how I want to think of a RAM computation. I want to think of the data in memory, just each uh, memory cell has one bit. For, so for here, let's consider just bits. And I want to think of the program execution as being really specified by some very simple CPU step circuit. Like that's actually what's, you know, what your laptop is doing. There's a CPU, it's some sort of a pretty small size circuit. The circuit gets some state, you can think of it as uh, the various registers, things like that. It does a little bit of computation, and then it says, okay, I want to read this location. You go in the, me you go in the memory, you read that location, you put it on this wire, there's a special read bit wire on the, on the next, execution, and then execute that circuit again. So I'm sort of unrolling it, but there's really one CPU step circuit. This, is, this, this circuit and this circuit are the same. Okay, and this is how I want to think of a RAM execution. So you can think of the initial state as specifying whatever, uh, some hard-coded values in the program, like some small input to the program, or you can think of what really happens, the, the actual code of the program would be written in memory, right? That's what really happens. So you can do that here. Okay, so how are we gonna garble this? So the way we're gonna garble this is we're gonna just take each of these CPU step circuits and garble them one by one independently. So even though it's all the same circuit, we're gonna garble it many times. How many times? As many times as, as the number of steps the computation takes. Okay, we're gonna run in time proportion to computation. And the state of the circuit is just going to be garbled and travel from one circuit to the next. It's going to remain garbled uh, on these, these wires are going to remain garbled. You can't really see them. Okay. And in addition, it's just going to output the read location in the clears. Okay. Because we're willing to reveal the locations that you're reading at this point. So that's going to be the garbled program. I'm going to say a little more about it in a sec. It's not exactly it, but almost. How are we going to garble the data? So in each location, I want to give you some sort of a key that depends on the data in that location. And the way we're going to do it is uh, we're just going to have a PRF key, F sub K. And if the data bit in location 1 is a 1, we're going to give you FK of 1, 1, otherwise FK of 1, 0. So we're going to give you PRF of the location and the bit in that location. So in each location, you have either PRF of I0 or I1. There's two values you could have in each location, depending on the data there. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is you can start executing this garbled circuit, right? That's fine. And then it says, okay, you should read like the bit in this location. So you read it, great. Now you need to put some value on this wire. What value do you put? You need to the label for this wire, okay? Now, ideally I would put that in the data, but I don't know, or I would make the, like, um, the label of this wire be the same as the value here, right? The two labels would be the two possible values here. The problem is when I'm creating these circuits at compile time or when I'm creating this garbled program, I don't know what data is going to be read. I don't know what locations are going to be accessed. That's only going to decide it at runtime. So I don't know how to do that. So I don't know how to make the label here match the one here. And the goal will be to somehow translate between them. So I want to somehow be able to translate between the keys I could have here for the two bits, zero and one, with the two labels I should put on this wire here. And the way to do that, so this really nice idea, is we're going to put a PRF key in the garbled circuits. So the garbled circuits will have a PRF key hard-coded in them. And they're going to uh, uh, compute 
some sort of a translation table that lets you translate between the data in, the in, in memory and the labels of this wire. Okay, so they're going to put two encryptions of the labels for this wire, label zero and label one, under the two possible values you could have in memory in that location. The point is this translation table is created at runtime. It's created by the circuit at runtime when it knows what location you're going to be reading in that ith step. You don't know this information at compile time. You can't just give it out ahead of time, but the circuit can create it at runtime. Okay, so that's it. That's the solution. Uh, so, you know, you would read the value in memory, decrypt one of these two ciphertexts, and then get the right bit for this wire and be able to execute the next circuit. Okay. So let's try to prove security, and something subtle happens. So I want to say that if you see this whole, you know, all these garbled circuit and the garbled data, you don't learn anything other than the output of the computation at the very end. So the good news is, okay, the first garbled circuit, you just get like this initial garbled state. So you can think of that as like some stuff that's hard coded in the, in the, in the beginning of the computation just to get it started. So you get some garbled value here. You don't learn by the security of garbled circuits, you don't learn anything other than the output. Okay, so all you learn are these two ciphertexts and the labels for the next, next state. Now, let's assume that, let's say, in memory at location i, there's the, the bit 1. So you can decrypt the label 1. Okay. Now, I want to use the security of the second, I want to rely on the security of this garbled circuit. Say you don't learn anything from that other than its output. Now, if you think about it, intuitively that's true because you don't have label zero. You only have one label for each of these wires, and that's exactly what, uh, uh, from Benny Stock, that's exactly what garbled circuits tell you. If you only have one label for each wire, you don't learn anything other than the output. So there's something subtle, which is the label for the other bit is, is you do have it encrypted. You have it encrypted under some value, some PRF value, fk of i0, and this PRF key is stored in this circuit. Okay. So ideally, I'd like to say that this ciphertext is secure. You shouldn't be able to decrypt it. You know, and intuitively you can't. But uh, in order to do that, in order to say that you can't decrypt the ciphertext, I need to rely on the secure of the encryption or the PRF key, this key k. But this key k is included in this garbled circuit, and in order to argue that you don't learn that PRF key, I need to use the secure of the garbled circuit, right? So I'm stuck. I don't know how to prove this. And there's a circularity problem here. We don't have a good proof for it. So for technical reasons, it's rectangular on the slide, but it's a circularity problem. So is it secure? Is there an actual problem? We don't know, actually. Probably for natural schemes, you won't find an attack. Sounds secure. But also, we don't know how to prove it, and there's no really nice assumption other than just, yeah, you can assume the whole thing is secure. That would let me prove it. I don't know any simple assumption. So can we fix it? And the idea is, yes, there's been a series of works proposing various fixes for this problem. Uh, so um, uh, so uh, one fix is to use identity-based encryption. I'll show you, actually, that's the fix I'm going to tell you how to do. I'm going to show you that one. That's probably the simplest one. Uh, so unfortunately, though, you need stronger assumptions. For garbled circuits, we just need one-way functions. Now you need identity-based encryption. Turns out there's actually better ways to do it just with one-way functions. So um, in this work, we showed how to do it with one-way functions, but didn't get quite polylogarithmic uh, overhead, got something like n to the epsilon. And then there's a really beautiful work that's coming up at this stock. Is that right? At this stock that shows how to get even the polylogarithmic overhead. And it's based on different techniques than the first fix. So it somehow uses uh, just one-way functions and PRFs. But again, the problem was that these PRF keys were hard-coded in all the circuits. So here you're somehow going to have an evolving key and make sure that the value that you need to protect the ciphertext in each step is not contained in any future circuit. That's really the main idea. But it's, uh, doing it is, is, is tricky. It's really nice work. And um, another fix, uh, actually that fixes more than just this problem, is even in the solution I showed you, if you, thought, if you think about it, it needed, you needed to garble a circuit that evaluates a PRF, okay, right? And that's a non-black box use of a PRF. That's sort of an inefficient thing. You're using one-way functions in a non-black box way. And so there's a really nice work, uh, recent work by Garg Lenostrowski, 
that shows how to solve this with just black box use of a PR. So you're not evaluating a PR of inside a garbled circuit or anything like that. So again, it seems, seems difficult if you think about what we were doing so far. So I'm just going to show you the simplest thing. Identity-based encryption sounds complicated because IB is complicated, but it's actually the simplest way to do this. And the idea is, you know, what, what was the problem? We were encrypting things, and the decryption key was hard-coded in various garbled circuits. So let's not, you know, let's use public key instead of symmetric key encryption. Instead of, so we don't, we shouldn't have to hard code the public key. If you, you know, the, the, the value hard code in the circuits would just be a public key, not a secret key. Seems like a simple enough problem, right? So we would just hard code public keys in the garbled circuits. That way they can still encrypt stuff, but now they can decrypt it, so you get security. The caveat is, you actually, it turns out you need identity-based encryption, not just regular public key encryption, but identity-based public key encryption. And I want to show you that even the original solution that I, I showed you on the previous slide, a good way of seeing it is as using some sort of an identity-based symmetric key encryption, which you can just build from PRFs. I'm going to show you that. So identity-based encryption has a short master public key that lets you encrypt any identity you want, and there's secret keys for various identities. So this is the solution I already showed you. I didn't change anything. This is the picture you saw before. And I want to reinterpret it as using symmetric key identity-based encryption. So I want to think of each of these values in the garbled memories as various secret keys for identities. So in each location i, you would have a secret key for the, for the identity, either i0 or i1, depending on the bit in that location. Okay, so I want to think of these as sort of secret key, identity-based secret keys. And what, what is this stuff? Well, this is real in identity-based encryption, a symmetric key one, that encrypts to the identities i comma zero and i comma one to the labels label zero and label one, respectively. Okay, and what's the what's this thing? It's a master secret key that lets you encrypt because this is a symmetric key encryption. So now let's use a public key encryption. What happens? Nothing really changes. Just we replace the master secret key with a master public key. So now I'm changing the notation, but these will still be secret keys for identities, you know, i comma zero, i comma one. I'm just going to write it this way. Uh, these will be just identity-based public key encryptions to the identities i zero and i one. And now the circuits have a hard-coded master public key, and this breaks the circularity, right? Because this ciphertext cannot be decrypted even if you know all the stuff hard-coded in, in the other circuits. Okay, so that was read-only computation. How do we allow writes? Do we have enough time to allow writes? Uh, uh, seven minutes. Seven minutes? Write in seven minutes. Okay, write in seven minutes. I'll, I'll, uh, so I'll, I'll say something uh, short. Let me even skip this. So uh, the, the main idea will be that uh, the garbled memory now will still have identity-based secret keys, but the identity will also have some sort of a time period associated with it. So it's not just the location number, but the time period J. So the secret keys in each location will be uh, secret keys for identity J, I, B, where I is the location, J is the last time that location was written to, and B is the bit in that location that was, that was written in that time period. And so to read the location I, to read any location, I just need to encrypt this identity. Okay, so I need to know the last time that location was written to, and let me just tell you that's not a problem and leave it at that, okay? <laughs> Uh, you can do that. And so, okay, so to read the location, we can just encrypt these two identities like we did before. To write to a location, though, I need to create a secret key for that time period, right? To write in time period J to a location I, I need to create the secret key. In order to create a secret key, it seems like I would need to have the master secret key in the circuits, right? And that would reintroduce circularity. So can you fix that? Turns out that yes, the idea would be to have some sort of a restricted secret key in each circuit at time period J that can only create secret keys for these identities, like that start with a J, but not for others. Okay, and this prevents the circular security because the ciphertext that any CPU step creates can be decrypted by future CPU steps. They only have weaker secret keys or different sec master secret keys that, that don't allow you to decrypt this stuff. So let me just say that because I want to. Um, okay, let me let me skip the, to skip this part. That's the high level of idea how to do writes. That lets you do the everything. So that lets that that gives you a solution for the garbled RAM program.
So I just wanted to mention, uh, I think Evgeny asked that, so this, if you compare this solution to what we are doing just by using Oblivious RAM to interact with the server, the one difference here is the server actually learns the output Y, right? He gets it in the clear. So is that a problem? And what about malicious server? Maybe he sends you the wrong Y. Can you actually be sure that you're getting the right value? I'm claiming you can fix both these problems very easily in one go. Instead of garbling the program P that just outputs some uh, value Y, garble program P prime that has a hard-coded secret key K and outputs an authenticated encryption of Y. So now the server does learn Y prime when he executes this garbled program, but that doesn't tell him anything about Y. And in fact, you can even check that you're getting the right answer back because it's an authenticated encryption. So where do you get randomness for this authenticated encryption? It's hard code in the program. Think of it as a, as, as a it could even be a one-time uh, determinacy. encryption needs fresh local randomness to produce those things. No, uh, it is a one-time, one-time encryption. So yeah, you don't need any random. Example, you need randomness. Uh, where do you get that randomness from a PRF? Some, some kind of some uh, yeah, you could have a PRF there. Okay. Um, yeah. Good. So let me just briefly mention the last part. Uh, it was planned to be brief anyway. So uh, I want to talk about the sync garbled RAMs. And the setting, the picture looks exactly the same as the last part. So what changes? Uh, one more efficiency requirement. So here, I don't want the client to do almost any work to garble program. So creating this garble program P should take time that only depends on the code size of this program, not the running time. Okay, so it's a lazy client. He's not doing the work. The server is doing all the work. So uh, the picture looks pretty much the same as what we had before. Just the, really the thing that changed was before this was uh, garbling the program. The efficiency of that was proportional to RAM runtime. Now it's just proportional to the code size. And again, the code size, you don't have to take it literal as being the code. It could just be whatever you need. Like if it's a database query, whatever search term you need to specify the, the query, the code could really live in, inside the memory. Okay, so whatever you need to specify the program you're, you're executing. So um, beautiful thing, there's been a lot, uh, uh, a series of recent works showing how to do this based on indistinguishable obfuscation. So unfortunately, we do need, at this point, we seem to need more powerful tools, like a uh, non-succinct version we just knew how to do from one-way functions. Here we're using much heavier machinery, but we get this amazing property. So there's been a series of works doing this. I don't want to say too much about each one, uh, but the good news is that uh, the last few works meet, so most of these meet like some small variant of the goal as I said it. The last few works actually meet the goal exactly. Um, there's actually some differences. So this work meets it where the amount of, um, to garble the data, you need to spend time proportional to not just the actual data you're garbling, but the max amount of memory that you'll ever use. Whereas the last two words, uh, the last two works actually let you even do it, let you do it in time proportional to just the amount of data you're garbling. Okay, so this makes sense even if you initially start out with no data outsourced to the server, and some of these programs will write some data as they're being executed. You can do that, whereas uh, in this work, you have to actually know how much memory you are going to need ahead of time. Uh, many of these works actually even achieve indistinguishable obfuscation for RAMs from I.O. for circuits, so you get even more. Uh, uh, so that's sort of a side benefit of what they do. And I want to say it's actually some of the techniques are also related to work on garbling Turing machines. So even though the settings are a little different and this talk is about RAMs, I don't want to talk about Turing machines, the techniques are somewhat related. So let me tell you just very, very you know, high level intuition, something about what's going on. So here's the naive way or the, the naive way that you would try to solve this problem if, if you were seeing it. You would say, well, let me just take this CPU step circuit that we were garbling many times before. You know, we were garbling it once to, you know, for every time step of the computation. And instead of doing that, let me just obfuscate it once. So I'm just going to give you an obfuscated CPU step circuit. Well, a little more than that. So it's a CPU step circuit that gets uh, the state encrypted, the state from the previous step encrypted, and also the read bit, whatever it read from the garbled data, also encrypted. And inside, it would just do the decryption, do some small computation, and then output the bit that it's reading for the next step, the bit that it's writing, the encryption of the bit that it's writing, and the encrypted state for the next step. 
And then you can keep executing this just by feeding this next state to itself and keep going. Okay, so that's the intuition of what you should do. Of course, this isn't good enough. You need to use ORAM and memory checking to ensure that the data is private. You know, that, um, for example, the, the access pattern doesn't, you know, the same reason we need ORAM all the time. This, you need to make sure that the access pattern, which you do get here in the clear, doesn't reveal anything about the actual access pattern of the computation. And you also need to make use some memory checking, at the very least, to make sure that you're getting the right values as you're, as you're reading these bits. So this seems intuitive enough. It's like such a simple scheme. Like, how hard can it be to prove this? So it turns out, if you think about it, it's actually very hard. To, it turns out to be very hard to pr prove it. But the amazing thing is that with uh, some special ORAM schemes, very specially designed ones, specially designed memory checking, specially designed encryption, and many other tricks, and about 60 to 160 pages worth of proof. So I think that's, uh, that's pretty much what those papers, the range that they fall into. Uh, you can prove this assuming indistinguishably obfuscation. So it seems so simple, but really very, very tricky to get this right. Um, uh, but achieve something really amazing. So uh, I want to stop there. So just some conclusions. We saw that if you have ORAM with server computation, by introducing server computation, you can get some nice benefits like reducing the bandwidth, reducing the round complexity, even getting completely non-interactive solutions. And reducing the client computation in the very last step where the client does no work, pretty much no work at all, and the server does all the work. Many open questions, so better lower or upper bounds on ORAM without server computation. Um, showing, um, um, getting a constant communication overhead ORAM, so a variant of the onion ORAM scheme I showed you from simpler assumptions, not necessarily homomorphic encryption, maybe one-way functions, why not? Um, simplify these 60 to 160 page works, uh, the succinct garbled RAM schemes. And maybe the, the most interesting question, can succinct garbled RAM be done without IO? It doesn't seem to inherently imply it. Can you do it without it? So uh, let me leave up here. And thank you. Last question: uh, what, what goes wrong if you try to use like a reusable garbled, garbled circuit instead of IO? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, reusable garbled it seems like it should work. The main problem is that in reusable garbled circuits, the garbled input has to always be bigger than the output. And if you think about it here, you're like feeding the garbled output into itself as a garbled input. So the lengths never work out. It seems like a small thing but it actually completely kills the solution. I mean, if you use simulation security, but you don't have to write. Well, but, ex and that's what those 62, I guess that's what those papers are sort of implicitly doing, right? Somehow saying you don't actually need to exactly have a garbled circuit with simulation for each step. Right? There's always a fresh little garbled circuit given out which is smaller than the actual computation, so there is no hope for sort of repetition in that sense, right? So for every input, there's right. a that's small, much smaller than the computation itself. So if you're giving away, uh, oh, what do you mean for every input? There's a fresh garbled circuit. So the reusable garbled circuit, right? For the you do the computation using that uh, the reuse part for for but for every computation you have to give a smaller garbled circuit to do the decryption at the end. So that part uh, it has to be sort of provided every time. Right? Uh, that makes itself sometimes. One. Well, I think the idea would be to just take this, whatever you were using obfuscation, you create one garbled circuit. But the problem is that here, the garbled input, the, the output should be a garbled input to itself. And we need the garbled input to be strictly bigger than the output. So this doesn't work. No, that, that's pretty much it. In fact, the, the length would grow expon you know, exponentially. Can you uh, do it under LWA using uh, Aloni's uh, suggestion? It's not a, uh, you could do something very heuristic, but it's, it's um, you would need to, off, you, you would need to garble random oracle, right? So that's sort of, so, so it's sort of, you could do it under assumptions that are known to be false uh, in, in that sense, but heuristically, it seems like it could work, yeah. Why, why would you need to garble the random oracle? Can't you just use the random oracle in order to compress your, uh, your input? Um, uh, not clear, we, not, not clear, not clear. We don't have, so there, there have been proposed solutions that did some reusable garbled circuits with this right efficiency, but they did need to garble the random oracle. I don't know of any solution that didn't need to do that. No, Good. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how to do it without, with, you know, it's, it's plausible. I don't see an impossibility. But, but either way, the, the, the basic security property we need to assume on the basic thing, that it's simulation, we would know is false. Sure. But okay. Why? But heuristically, the whole thing could work. I agree. No, you could resolve to indistinguishability. What do you mean? No, that's very hard. I don't know how to compose indistinguishable. I, I mean, okay. yeah. So even if you had indistinguishably based um, uh, garbled circuits, I don't know how to. It, that's essentially what those works are somewhat doing implicitly, but it, it, that that's not easy to do. It's not easy to use indistinguishably based definitions to get the full goal at the end. Just indistinguishably based definitions don't compose nicely, and here you're iterating things. That's the main problem. So is there any part of your presentation that uh, can be practical? At the, the server-aided uh, ORAM stuff? Uh, the onion ORAM, I think, could be practical for big enough block sizes. And if you really were in a setting where you care about bandwidth much more than the amount of computation the server does, because uh, in contrast to regular ORAM here, the server is doing some Fairly light, but additively homomorphic encryption operations, which you know it's much better than FHE, but still it's it's heavier than just uh, uh, you know symmetric key crypto, which basic ORAM was doing. But if you really care about bandwidth much more than computation, then yes, this could be, and in some settings you might, then that that could be practical. Okay, so let's thank Daniel again.